this series of Sustainable Energy, we've uncovered some of the most groundbreaking energy efficiency innovation out there. And in today's episode, coming to you from Los Angeles, we retrace our steps around the world to meet the people making change happen as we relive our series highlights. At a time when many countries aren't hitting climate agreement goals, the need for improvements in energy efficiency has never been more pressing. And in this series of Sustainable Energy, we've met committed researchers, citizens, organisations and startups, all determined to shake up the energy landscape. Coming up. We look back at innovations that are cleaning up everything from fashion to food production transforming our buildings and built environments for the better, and enabling renewable energy to rise over efficiency challenges. And I met Dr. Anita Sengupta for a glimpse at the green roadmap of the future. But first, let's take a look at some facts and figures. The estimated share of renewables in global electricity generation was more than 26% by the end of 2018. It is predicted that 650 million people will still be left without access to electricity in 2030. Nine out of ten of them will be living in sub-Saharan Africa. To connect the poorest and hardest to reach households, off-grid solutions including solar lighting, solar home systems and increasingly many grids will become crucial. We all need food, clothes and transport, but we don't need the carbon footprint that goes with them. Thankfully, entrepreneurs are striving to create carbon-free, energy-efficient industry. Mud jeans make premium jeans from organic cotton and between 23 to 40 percent post-consumer recycled denim. A conventional pair of jeans can use up to 7,000 litres of water in production. Mud Jeans, however, uses 78% less water throughout its life cycle compared with industry standards. By opting for fabrics with recycled cotton, the company can avoid using insecticides and pesticides and save garments from landfill. It also uses energy efficient production techniques and renewable energy sources throughout its supply chain. What makes Mud Jeans special is that we are the one and only circular denim brand in the world. That means that we take back old jeans and make new jeans out of them. We make sure that the, the, the way we, we make the jeans and, and the way we treat them in the washing, uh, we don't use uh, chemicals or water, we use laser techniques and ozone techniques, so that means the yarns remain strong, they're not harmed by, by the chemicals. And uh, in that way, we believe and we found out that our jeans last longer. Vast energy savings are clearly in fashion. Over in food production, there is also significant moves to save energy. In Millis, USA, Crop One Holdings is working with Emirates Flight Catering to build the largest vertical farm in the world, measuring 130,000 square feet and running parallel to the runway at Dubai Airport. Vertical farming basically allows us to grow our food where we eat it and when we want to eat it. And the vertical piece of it is the fact that we're not growing just in a single layer of land, but stacking growing shelves one on top of the other. The goal is to produce more food whilst using less space, water and energy, specifically to harvest three US tons of high quality herbicide and pesticide free leafy greens daily using 99% less water than outdoor fields. Being indoors you have the ability to control all the environmental variables, for example temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide levels that we feed to the plant and having control over those variables means that you can control the way that the plants grow. The second thing is that you can grow at very high density and so that leads to a very high output for the same amount of growth area. Meanwhile in Israel, entrepreneurs at Home Biogas are converting food waste into a clean biogas for home cooking. Leftovers are placed in a tent-like contraption which can be kept in the garden. Inside the digestion tank, the bacteria break down the organic material and release a clean biogas, all without any electricity. For energy, for electricity, for hot water, for anything that we need, all of it can come from the organic material providing a sustainable way for energy. 
Technology which tackles the issue of food waste and indoor air pollution is surely a welcome addition to any household's menu. And when it comes to transport, how about a car with zero carbon emissions? Nested in the Welsh countryside, River Simple aims to eliminate the environmental impact of personal transport with a hydrogen-powered car that's fuel efficient. It can travel up to 300 miles on 1.5 kilograms of hydrogen. That's equivalent to nearly 250 miles per gallon. By designing a car around the characteristics of hydrogen, rather than trying to shoehorn hydrogen fuel cells into cars that are designed for petrol engines, you build a, can build a completely different sort of car. It takes all the stress off the technology and hardwired into our model is a fundamentally cheaper, lighter and more efficient car than the way the industry is making cars. Dr. Anita Sengupta is an aerospace engineer, rocket scientist, professor and pilot. She has previously worked for NASA and is co-founder at Airspace Experience Technologies. And she now uses her space programme experience to develop sustainable mobility solutions. Well, Doctor, first of all, thank you so much for having us here in beautiful, sunny Los Angeles, and we've got lots and lots to talk about. But I want to start by asking you, there are some industries that are particularly bad when it comes to pollution and waste. What advice would you give to policymakers or individuals when it comes to those industries? So there's several things that you can do, and the first one, I think, is to make sure that your energy comes from a renewable source, and the second one is to be able to implement a circular economy model to reduce waste. So we're starting to hear a lot about reusing almost everything, but I'm interested, how feasible is it actually, realistically, for us to reuse practically everything? I think it is quite feasible, and you have to think about the ways in which you do it. And a great example of how everything is reused is on the International Space Station in terms of recycling of water, waste products, and even carbon dioxide, which is in the atmosphere. And even those kinds of models could be used in your daily lives here at home. How easy would it be to implement something that's used in space, though, here on Earth? So it's really thinking about how you can reduce your total amount of waste. So a great example from your food products would you would compost, right? So the compost can be turned into soil and you can grow plants with it. Tell us how you envisage the future of urban transportation, particularly over the next decade or so. I envision all forms of urban transportation shifting to electric vehicles, whether that's electric cars, electric buses, electric trains, and even electric airplanes for urban air mobility. I mean, that's pretty radical, all forms of transport. What are the challenges to that going forward? The challenges, I think, are largely adoption, because some people are worried about, you know, range anxiety. Can I drive my car far enough? Can I fly my airplane uh, um, far enough? And that certainly is a real concern, but ultimately the adoption has to come from both the private sector and the public sector. We've spoken quite a lot in this series of Sustainable Energy about smart cities. Can you tell us what you understand by that and how you see them over the coming years? So smart cities are going to have at their core technologies, policies, and implementation of practices related to sustainability. That's the way I envision it. So that means from a transportation side, from an energy production side, and from an energy storage side. And what needs to happen in terms of the development of smart cities for it to be adopted and for all cities to become smart? There has to be uh, funding associated with actually implementing these changes into cities. There has to be willingness from the policymaker side as well as from the inhabitants who live in those cities. But ultimately, that work is underway in the context of research and development, so it has to go into implementation. How important is the cooperation between policymakers and individuals or communities with that? It's absolutely key, because if you're not supporting each other, it's not going to happen. So the only way you get that public acceptance is by working together closely. So inevitably, when we think about sustainable energy, we have to think about transportation and green transportation in particular. What is the future of green transportation? So when we talk about transportation, we have to think about all transportation, all modes, whether that's urban, suburban, rural, cross-country, transatlantic, trans-Pacific. And so the shift there will be to electric vehicles and specifically for aviation, which is really long range, shift over to hydrogen fuel cells. Lots more to come from you later on in the show. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. After the break, we open the doors on enlightening clean energy solutions. In this series, we've shone a light on the power of renewable energy to transform lives, communities and buildings for the better. We've seen positive change everywhere from the rural outposts to the metropolis. Frontier Markets recruits and trains women in rural India to work as solar sahelis or solar friends, selling solar energy products to people in neighbouring villages. They walk from village to village, demonstrating the benefits of clean energy solutions and persuading people to invest. We found an opportunity to really bring women into the value chain in a way that did not exist before. 
We also learned that 70% of our users were women. So when you're understanding the burden of electricity and you're starting to think about who is the best to connect with that, it became women. With a network of 5,000 female entrepreneurs built up since 2011, Frontier Markets is edging ever closer to reaching its goal of providing rural customers with access to high quality clean energy solutions, a prerequisite of Sarah Aljavin, or an easy life for rural customers. Clean energy is also improving quality of life for people in inner city areas of London, such as Hackney and Brixton. Repowering is a not-for-profit organisation that combats fuel poverty by setting up community-owned renewable energy power stations on social housing buildings and transport networks. Repowering's vision is like this, solar panels on social housing where communities come together in one vote, one share cooperatives and share in the energy savings and reductions and also in the idea that they are making a direct impact on global climate change. Since it was set up in 2011, it has installed 234 kilowatt peaks of community-owned renewable energy in London. The company says it saved over 100 tonnes of CO2 per annum, the same as 100 return flights from London Heathrow to Sydney International. While there are hundreds of social housing blocks which have solar panels on them, this is one of our co-ops in Hackney. There were 14 buildings and 387 flats. Of that, 90% of the investment comes from within one mile, and 30% are actually in these buildings. And it's important to them because 60% of their energy is coming from their rooftops. So it's clear that clean energy has great potential to power and empower individuals and communities. A smart move. Buildings are also becoming smarter, greener and more human-centric that's attuned to people's needs. Tieto in Finland is an IT software and solutions company that works in and with the energy sector to develop and implement sustainable building solutions. It uses digitization and smart technology in offices to make them more environmentally friendly, but also, crucially, to help boost employee well-being, productivity and innovation. Our data centers in the Nordics operate on green energy and for instance here in the city of Espoo we collaborate with our customer the energy company to use the excess heat from the data centers to warm the nearby houses so by doing this we actually warm around thousand homes here in Espoo Using solutions that combine sensor technologies, the internet and data-driven analytics, all the different building systems are constantly monitored and information is fed back to the owners. That way, heating, cooling and lighting can be centrally managed. When we introduced this system, we also realised that it's, it must be fun for people to use the data in this way and therefore we could see a peak in the utilisation rate people are more present. I mean, for us, it's okay to do remote work, but people wanted to come to office to work physically together. Tieto currently has thousands of customers globally in sectors that range from energy, oil and gas, banking, healthcare and welfare to forests. The vision is that carbon-free, energy-efficient buildings will one day become the norm. Let's think a bit about renewable energy schemes. Can you tell us how can it empower individuals and communities when we think about the developing world? So it can empower them because ultimately they can be directly responsible for improving the quality of their own lives. And a great example of that would be air pollution. So if the community was directly involved in the solution, uh, then they would be able to have a better quality of life. And they could potentially even have a business as a result of it. When we look at multi-energy schemes and renewable energy schemes, how integral to the success of those is the sense of ownership and individuality? I think it's key because sometimes with these systems, if it's coming from solar, if it's coming from wind, you're going to have to look at different usage profiles. Therefore, the community has to be willing to adjust their usage as a result and realize that they're helping the community as a whole. As someone who's worked on some of the most exciting engineering technology in the world, what in particular is inspiring for you about intelligent buildings at the moment? I think the push towards sustainability is by far and large the most important thing, whether that's from a energy consumption perspective, whether it's from a thermal management perspective, and whether it's from a, a way to be more efficient in terms of the building materials that we use. How do we make buildings more efficient and more intelligent and go along with your ideas that, you, that you've spoken about there? 
So you would choose new technologies, right? So if you're looking at ways to produce energy on the building itself with solar panels on the roof, or the other example um, would be using algae also to produce energy, ways that you would use insulation materials so that you reduce heat loss. There's so many ways that you could be more efficient, which would reduce the carbon footprint for that infrastructure component. Now, of course, the technology that we're talking about brings with it some inherent dangers in terms of monitoring, in terms of privacy, and so on. For you, do the potential benefits outweigh the dangers? They do, but only if we ensure people's individual privacy. And how do we do that? We have to make sure that we have the regulations in place before the technology is implemented. <laughs> lots to come in terms of that, but also lots to come from Dr. Anita later in the show as well. First, though, maybe you thought you knew everything there is to know about smart cities. Well, here's one common misconception. You thought you knew? Think again. Myth. Smart cities are only feasible for big cities in a developed world. Fact. Exemplary smart cities can be small and in the developing world. When it comes to being smart, size does not matter. 30% of all smart city projects are in areas with a population of 150,000 or less. A smaller population may make it easier to connect industry, startups, community groups and individual citizens. It's important to consider that smart city initiatives can include everything from the use of ICT to public spaces with free Wi-Fi, to solar power streetlights, to innovative car parks, all of which can be found in both the developed and developing world. Coming up after the break, we see how renewables are rising over challenges of the past. Common criticisms of clean energy are that it's unpredictable, inefficient and intermittent. And now, thanks to new technology, these challenges are no longer insurmountable. ReuniWatt in Reunion has invented cutting-edge technology which forecasts the volume of energy which solar plants will produce in the minutes, hours and days ahead. That way customers can manage the energy they produce effectively, increase their trading revenue and give a reliable estimate of how much energy they can supply to the grid. As solar developed very fast in Reunion Island, the grid electricity operator was worried about potential impact on the grid stability. The grid operator decided not to connect any longer solar farms to the grid. Something had to be done in order to enable a safe and massive penetration of photovoltaics on the grid. Solar forecasting is the simplest, cheapest way to mitigate the risk. So ReuniWatch shows that forecasting solar energy production in the short term is possible, as is integrating this energy smoothly, efficiently and profitably into the grid. Another criticism levelled at renewables is a lack of adequate storage systems. In the USA, STEM is addressing this by coupling energy storage with artificial intelligence. Its technology allows customers to store renewable energy on a major scale so that they can use it when and where they need it, saving time and money. We build and operate the largest digitally connected network of intelligent energy storage solutions that's all cloud enabled and is driven by our AI software platform that we call Athena. STEM's AI-powered energy storage solution gives businesses flexibility and control over their energy spend. We lower costs by storing electricity when it's affordable and using it later when costs are high. It is also committed to creating a cleaner, more efficient and more modern grid. The technology can be used to match up a specific customer's needs with wind and solar energy that's stored in the battery supply and send it there quickly and efficiently. Meanwhile, Invelio, a startup in Germany, is also driving the digital transformation of energy grids forward with a view to integrating renewables into the system on a massive scale. Its software system aims to help distribution grid operators to manage their workflows, but also to plan for an increased use of renewables, for instance by accelerating the connection process for new wind parks and solar power plants. It also helps them to be more efficient. With our software, we are helping um, distribution system operators to integrate renewables faster in their grids and also be more direct with their customers. So for example, we are providing an online quick check where grid customers can easily pinpoint a location on a map 
enter the uh, load or re renewable uh, source they wanted to con connect to the grid there and then just get a response whether it's possible or not within seconds um, as of uh, weeks as it is today. Another challenge for clean energy is large-scale curtailment due to lack of power system flexibility. The research of Professor Chong King Kan and Dr. Ning Xiang at Xianghao University in China reveals how integrating multi-energy systems, or MES for short, could help solve the issue. Jilin province is a very cold province with six months of centralized heating. It is also very rich in wind power. The multi-energy solution there is to use electric boiler and heating storage to use the wind power that might have been curtailed at night to produce heat. So multi-energy systems increase the efficiency and flexibility of both energy supply and consumption, so they can be used when and where they're needed and any excess energy is saved as opposed to curtailed and wasted. According to the research of our five-year projects, by 2030, more than 35% of the energy demand will be supplied by the renewables. The number will reach 60 to 70% by year 2050. Now, when it comes to sustainable energy, we spend a lot of time thinking about storage, batteries, and so on. For you, what are the most interesting types and systems of renewable energy storage right now? So what I'm specifically looking at is batteries because we're trying to facilitate electric aviation. So higher energy density batteries is the key to happen that happen in the near term. But there's other technologies such as solar concentrators, which would allow you to put energy into the grid or a smart grid. And in the future, hydrogen fuel cells, which would facilitate fully electric long range air travel. And what are the particular advantages that those have over traditional lithium-ion batteries, for example? Ultimately, you're improving energy density, so you're getting more energy per unit mass. So we've thought quite a lot in this series of sustainable energy about smart grids. For you, what role do you think they'll play in the energy transition? So they're key in order to regulate how energy is produced and how it's put back out into the community. So if you're looking at different sources of energy like wind and solar, it's going to be coming and going at different times of the day. So the smart grid will allow you to manage that more efficiently. Let's move on to an area maybe for which you're the best known, and outer space. Can you see a role for outer space in a sustainable future? Absolutely, and the reason for that is outer space means solar, and all the energy that we actually comes into this planet right now comes from the sun. So if you can actually have a space-based source of power, which is, let's say, solar panels in space, or solar base on the moon, which is transported back here to Earth in terms of the power consumption, you can have a renewable source that comes from space and from our sun more directly. Science fiction or science possibility? Science possibility because it's used on spacecraft all the time. All spacecraft are fully electric using solar panels. And so how can we translate that kind of technology here into Earth? So we want to be able to utilize technologies directly from the space program related to more efficient solar panels, which you can have in solar farms here on Earth. What key lessons can you bring from your work as a rocket scientist that might help us tackle climate change here on Earth? So many, because when you're designing a spacecraft mission, you have to optimize around power, around mass, around volume to solve a very complex system. So when we look at sustainability solutions, we're looking at new technologies with those same constraints. Well, the climate crisis and the extinction crisis is a complex problem. Can we distill that problem right down to an optimization conundrum? Absolutely, and the optimization parameter there would be reducing our carbon footprint. And so looking at that and looking at the future, are you positive or negative about the future of this planet? I'm very positive because I work in the tech sector. Many people work in the tech sector. People who are providing capital to the tech sector are all focused on sustainable solutions to our challenges. Dr. Rhea, it's been fascinating and an absolute pleasure and honor to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Sustainable Energy. Thank you. So with innovation improving energy efficiency, cleaning up everything from fashion to food production in buildings, whilst empowering individuals to take clean energy into their own hands, the future looks bright for sustainable energy. And that's all from us for now, but we like to think that we've left you with plenty of food for thought to fuel the ongoing energy discussion for years to come. Share your series highlights with us. We'd love to hear from you on Twitter at CNBC Energy using the hashtags AskSE and Sustainable Energy. Our sustainable energy journey draws to a close here, but that's no reason why we can't all keep thinking green. Goodbye. Goodbye.